This morning I'm going to, um, to speak a message, and now all of you who have been following um, and have been here um, over the past two months, you guys know that I've been speaking through the book of 1 John. Now, we finished our series in 1 John last week, and, and, and this week we're going to continue in the Johns, um, and we're going to talk about, this morning we're talking about 1 John, or 2 John. 2 John is uh, the passage this morning that we're going to be uh, going to. Would you bow with me in prayer? Jesus, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. Your word is life. God, we pray that your spirit would quicken our understanding so that we would understand exactly what it is that you have to say to us this morning in your word, O oh God. And we thank you, God, for the opportunity to be in a free country, to live in a place where we can experience the, uh, the preached word of God. And God, I pray that you would anoint my lips so that I would speak truth from your perspective, God, that your ideas would flow through. In Jesus, we praise you and we thank you in your name. Amen. So, if you turn with me in your Bibles, if you have them, or if you want to follow with, your, with the overhead here, um, the title of my message is Staying on Track. And I believe that's the theme of the book of, of 2 John. And this morning we're just going to start by reading the first two verses. Um, here we go. Verse 1. The elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children whom I love in the truth. And not I only, but also who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. So we enter this book, and John has addressed this book to the chosen lady, lady chosen by God and to her children. Now, according to church accounts, John the Apostle was the only apostle that, that uh, was part of that group in the first century that didn't die a martyr's death. And, and, and by the time he, he wrote this epistle, this second uh, John, we, we believe it was about A.D. 90 when this was, was written. And, and at that particular time, the apostle John was a very old man. And uh, he was likely in his 90s. And the second letter of John appears to have been written to a chosen lady and her children who were standing in the truth. Well, you ask yourself, well, who was this chosen lady and why does she appear in, uh, in 2 John? Was this lady a prominent figure? Now, John was, was uh, in Ephesus at the last part of his life. We're told that he was probably buried in Ephesus. Now, he had spent time exiled on the island of Patmos, but he was some time later released and he became, uh, he was pastor, bishop of Ephesus. Now, so, there's speculation about who this lady was. Well, no, nobody knows for certain her identity. There's been some speculation in texts um, in the early church that this lady was maybe some prominent figurehead in the Asian church, the Asia Minor church of that day. But um, I was thinking about this, and, and I, it just a thought occurred to me as I was reading it. You know, it would be just like John to address the universal church this way. You see, I, I think what he's talking about here, I actually think he's referring to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and all of those who would be born again and be in the family of God after her. If you read that, to the lady chosen by God. She was chosen by God to bear the Son. Now, there's been some some bad teaching out there where Mary is actually deified and, and worshipped as though she was God. No, she wasn't. She was not God, and you don't have to go to Mary before you go to God. You can go directly to God through Jesus Christ, right? You can do that. But Mary holds a, a, a special place because she was chosen by God to bring the greatest blessing that had ever been brought into the world, and that is our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Virgin Mary was blessed by God, and the Spirit of God overshadowed her, and she became great with child. We are told the Christmas story. Well, this makes sense. John is writing this letter to the entire church. 
the entire church, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that, okay? I don't want to say that's exactly what it is because nobody knows for sure. But I was thinking about that and I thought, this is plausible. I, uh, um, her children are likely those who have come to faith after her, supernaturally born again by the Spirit, just as she was supernaturally with child from the Lord. And the Holy Spirit gave life. Now, after the time that the Apostle Paul was beheaded outside of the city of Rome, the Apostle John was released from exile. He, uh, he became this bishop in Ephesus, and Ephesus at that particular time was a centerpiece in the Christian community. Like, there was churches all over Asia that Paul had planted, and, and Barnabas, and, and Silas, and all, all those guys had planted different churches everywhere, but Ephesus was one of the big churches that was central to, to uh, the spreading of the gospel into, into Asia. Now, John probably didn't use his own name because this was likely written after the Apostle Paul had been beheaded. And um, the, he probably isn't using his, his own name because um, I think they were getting persecuted fairly heavily. And if his name was known... Um, they might just execute him. So um, his, his letter was signed as the elder. So this letter, now all this background stuff, guys, I just wanted to share that with you because I think it's important for us to get our minds back into that, into that, into that context because everything that we study in the Word of God needs to be studied through the lens of, of proper context. So I just wanted to, to get that, that straight there. Now, it seems as though this letter was written to encourage all true believers in Jesus Christ to pursue what was important and essential and to warn about the dangers of getting sidetracked by unsound doctrine. Now, John had a good heart. We know this because of the 12 disciples, John, along with Peter and James, they, they were the closest disciples to the Lord. And, and the, the Bible tells us that John was the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, I find that very interesting. He, he, was, he was close to Jesus, and Jesus loved John's heart. He loved who John was, and, and John's heart was soft towards God, and, and Jesus knew that. And, and John became um, a, a pivotal figure in the establishment of the foundation of the church. But, you see, not now... John being an elderly man, he makes it very plain in the beginning of this epistle that he loved this lady and her children in the Lord. In other words, the love of God that was bestowed upon John flowed out through him to the rest of the family of God. And when you look through the New Testament scriptures, you'll find a common thread when it comes to God's definition of love. True Christian love always rests on the truth which is manifested in the revealed Word of God. And it is always, always, always focused, it's always focused on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And further to this text this morning, in John chapter, the Gospel of John chapter 14, 6 and 7, when the original 12 disciples were asking Jesus about his relationship to the Father, Jesus answered and he said, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, why am I talking about that? Well, it's very essential for us to understand that the love of God that John is expressing that he has for this lady and her chosen children, it comes from God. It comes from the heart of God. It comes from the only way to the Father through Jesus Christ. Many times people criticize Christians for claiming that Jesus is the only way to God. Have you heard it? Some people say, you know, 
there's billions of people in this world who do not follow Jesus, and the critique is something like this. Well, are you guys so narrow-minded and bigoted that you believe that all these people will be excluded from heaven just because they were born in the wrong country? Or, or maybe they've been taught the wrong religion? Hmm. The critics say this. They ask this question. If we're to answer these critics, I think we need to make a point. The first point that we have to make is that we did not invent the claim that Jesus is the only way. That's not invented by us. Jesus made this claim himself. We're relating his claim. And the claim of the writers of the New Testament who were with Jesus when he walked this world. For example, the Apostle Peter told the crowds that he was addressing in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 12, he said this. He said, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by, much, by which we might, must be saved. And the Apostle Paul also said this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 5-7. He said, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for, not just some people, for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. That's Paul's account. See, that this truth claim that Jesus is the only way to God is straight from Jesus and his apostles. And it's very specific. It is a truth claim that is not open-ended. Jesus is the only way to salvation for humanity. Jesus is not just a white man's God in North America. Jesus is God over the entire planet. And his message is to go into all of the world, to every person, no matter what, what culture they're from, no matter what their background is, whether their old, their old relatives were Vikings or whether they're First Nations or Chinese, it doesn't matter. It is one God who's created the entire world and one Savior overall who's been appointed. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. One mediator between God and mankind. So when we speak to the people that are questioning critics, they're crit criticizing us, we need, to un we need to explain to them that this is God's idea. To understand the reason for the specific path, path, we have to go back to the beginning. We're told in the first chapter of Genesis that God created man and woman and placed them in this perfect environment and took care of all of their needs. We know the story of Adam and Eve. All of us know this. Maybe you, you're here this morning, I shouldn't say all, and you've never heard this before, but Adam and Eve are the first people that God created. We, we, see, we read of this in Genesis. And they were created in God's image to be caretakers of the planet, and they were only given one prohibition. And that prohibition was that they were not to eat from the, fr the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told them that if they did this, if they ate of that fruit, that they would surely die. And despite the warning, we know the story that uh, both Adam and Eve sinned against God. They disobeyed God. They ate from the tree after Satan had tempted Eve. Sin came into the world. And as a result of sin coming into the world, the death penalty for sin was over all of humanity. All of us, Adam and Eve's offspring, throughout the ages, feel the effects of this. And as a result of the fall, we see the res results. There's brokenness that has come to our planet, right? We see it everywhere. Firstly, the relationship with God and humanity was broken. It was shattered by this. Secondly, the relationship with God and, 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 uh, and a person on an individual level was broken. So, humanity in general, the individuals, the, the relationship person to person was broken. How many here know of people that are in despair right now because of the brokenness that has happened when another person sinned against them or they sinned against someone else? We see this ravaged planet 
with sin everywhere and people hurting one another, people thinking of themselves and not the other person and, and doing things that hurt the other person and doing things that we know hurt other people. The sinner is all over the place. Broken, broken. The relationship between, <laughs> between humanity and nature is also broken, right? I, I, don't, I don't subscribe to everything I hear on the news channel, you know? But, but there's definitely been a brokenness that's happened between nature and the human uh, race. So in those four areas, the spawn of corruption of the fall has impacted the world on every front. But you know, the, the good thing about God is that he never, he never allows something to happen without a plan. Right off the get-go, in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15, God spoke to Satan and, perce- and predicted that in the future, the offspring of Eve would crush his head and like a snake, s- Satan would strike the Savior's heel and would, would inflict some pain on the Savior. Nevertheless, his head would be crushed. A- and God said this in Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. The first thing to note is that there would be enmity between Satan and the human race. The definition of enmity in the dictionary, in Oxford's dictionary anyways, is the state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. So past this point, and even before this point, but specifically past this point, Satan has been the enemy of mankind. He's been the enemy of mankind. And, and some people think, oh, the devil is not that bad. He's just misunderstood. No, he's not a misunderstood. The devil is out for destruction. He is the enemy of humanity. He deceives people by coming to them as an angel of light, pretending that he is going to give them something good when his plans are destruction. And he will get people to do things thinking that they're going to do something good for themselves when in fact what he's trying to do is set them up for for destruction. There is no friendliness in Satan. Satan is our enemy. He's our, arch, he's our enemy throughout the age. He is a thief. He is a, he, he is a destroyer. John 10, verse 10 in the gospel, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and may have it to the full. So there's the contrast. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes to bring life and bun, abundant life to his people, full life. Satan is not your friend. Don't play with darkness. Don't play with the things of Satan because he is out to destroy you. He is not in your corner. He's not someone to be tinkered with. Have nothing to do, the Bible says, with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Rather expose them. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Satan is your enemy. Don't forget about it. No matter what you're doing, if you're turning on your, your media, Satan is your enemy. Don't leave any foothold for him. In your relationships, don't leave any foothold for the enemy. Now, Satan, it says here, it's really interesting <laughs> that God stated that the offspring of Eve would be crushing his head. You see, thankfully, This prophecy has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The power of sin has been broken for those who submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and of death. There is freedom in Jesus from the tyranny of the enemy. The power of Satan has been crushed under his foot. The word did come true. God became a man in the person of Jesus. And Jesus eventually died in our place. He died in our stead so that we could enjoy the right relationship with God. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, he says, 
that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And in verse 21, the Apostle Paul continues in that passage of 2 Corinthians, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, if mankind could have reached God in any other way, then Jesus would not have had to die. Jesus' death illustrates the fact that there is no other way to the Creator. There is no other way to the Father God. Jesus Himself is the gate. He is the path that leads to the, the Lord, and there is none other. You see, God Himself became a man and died so that we wouldn't have to. So that you wouldn't have to. So that I wouldn't have to. There's no religion or religious experience or religious leader that can bring someone to the true knowledge of God. It is God Himself who brought us to Himself. Truth. Truth is reality as it really is. And when it comes to understanding God, the truth of who He is and who He has revealed Himself in this written Word. That is reality. When you read the Word of God, you're really reading the reality of God and, what, and who He is. You can't make God someone that He isn't. Many people like to try and make God according to their own image. But all views on God that are out there, and there's a lot of them, I talk to some people and their ideas of God can be way, way different than what we're taught. All views of God that diverge from the truth are not truth. Truth is specific, just as the Savior is specific. There's one way to God through Jesus, and there is only one truth. Everything else that is not of the truth is an illusion of the truth and is actually a falsity. It is a lie. Think about that. We live in this age where all some people say, this is my truth, that's your truth. You live according to your truth, I'll live according to my truth. No, there is only truth and there is mistruth or, or lies. There's only truth or lies. There's only one truth. You know, that's why I can't call myself something I'm not. I can't do that. Why? Because the truth is that I am who I am, who God's made me to be. The truth of the matter is that we, we're sitting here right now. I had a physics teacher what, that, what that once told me, well, if you turn your head, you're no longer in existence because you can't see yourself. If you turn your head, you no longer exist. If you walk out of the room, no one in that room actually exists. The only time you, you exist is actually, is actually when you step into the room. Absurd! In their wisdom, they became fools, the Bible says. <laughs> they think not the knowledge of God worthwhile to retain, therefore he gives them over to a reprobate mind to do what ought not be done. This is the way that the world has turned. Truth. In fact, if it is not based upon the words of God, what is truth? The Lord says in the, in the Scriptures? My Word is truth. And who is the living Word of God? The embodiment of truth. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. Now, when Pontius Pilate was questioning Jesus prior to His crucifixion, Pilate was trying to determine if Jesus was a threat to the crown of Rome. It was all a secular show when you look at that. When you look at Jesus, when he was brought before Pilate, he was trying to figure out whether Jesus was going to be like some sort of revolutionary that was going to oh, try and raise up an army, like what happened later in AD 70, right? So he said, he's asking Jesus if Jesus is a king. He wants to know if Jesus claims to be a king. Pilate then went back inside, John 18, 33 to 37. You'll see why I'm reading all this in a few minutes. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? 
Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Well, am I a Jew? Pilate said. Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? What is it that you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my, king, my kingdom is from another place. Ah, you are a king then, Pilate, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Wow, what a powerful statement. Pilate didn't know what he was talking about. He says, what is truth? I mean, I don't know what truth is. And he proceeded to hand Jesus over to be crucified and made them put a sign on his cross saying, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. God knew that they would do this. It was a testimony. Yeah, Jesus is the King of the Jews. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah, born of the Virgin. Born of Mary, who came into the world so what, what John is saying in, in the opening to his letter is that he and others who live by the truth, what does he say? He says, have love for everyone else who is living in the truth as well. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another, 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Okay, that's 1 John 4, 7 and 8. But he continues, John continues in verse 3 of 2 John, and he says, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son be with us in truth and in love. In truth and love. Well, why does John and many of the other writers pray for the church with these words? Now, I know I've mentioned this before, but I think it's worthwhile to revisit because these words are very specific. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ. This is a prayer. Well, like John, the other writers of the New Testament that were inspired by God to write it recognize that God is the one that gives us the provisions for life. God is the one who gives provisions to His children to live in such a way that is fitting for a saint. The power to be God's holy people is rooted in His truth and has been given to us because of His great love for us. You see the connection point? The great love of God is connected deeply to His truth. They're inseparable. We love God, we love Jesus because He first loved us. Seeing what love has been lavished upon us, that we should be called the children of God and that is what we are, it certainly has had an impact. Or it should have an impact. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, open your heart and experience the fullness of the love of God because it has been lavished upon you in full measure. And God desires that His love flow into you and through you, not only to yourself, but to others around you. Why? Because that's the heart of God. The heart of God is selfless. Love is is gentle, it's kind. Oh, the, the 1 Corinthians 13. I won't go over that again, but that's where you find the definition. See, seeing what love has been lavished on us. You see, we have a, we have a choice to make now that that love has been given to us, that love has been lavished upon us. We're, we're given a choice now. But that decision, that choice to give our hearts over to the Lord's mastery, okay, is influenced by a compulsion by the Holy Spirit to be obedient. See, not only is love meshed with the truth, love is meshed with obedience to the Word of God. Love and truth together compel us toward obedience. If we understand the love of God and the truth of God's Word, 
To love me is to obey me. That's what the Lord says. If you love me, you obey what I command. Overcoming power in this life comes from the grace, mercy, and peace extended to us by God through the person of Jesus and the power, indwelling power of the Holy Spirit given us to by the given to us by the Father as a gift. So walk in truth and love. John is trying to say this. Folks, this is why I believe this message is for the universal church. He is saying that if you claim to be a disciple of Christ, you need to walk in the truth and love of God because it's been given to you and it's not something you can, you can force yourself to do. It's something you yield to and then it flows from you. Apostle John says in verse 4 to 6, It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing to you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. Did you get that? Listen to that. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his command. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. If we truly understand the love of God and the forgiveness that he's given to us by his grace and mercy, when the calling comes to be his holy people, it's not going to be something that is unnatural to us. No. No. We will want to be holy. We will be compelled to be holy because we love God and we want to be with Him and we want to walk with Him and we want us, Him to be our daddy. We don't desire to do things on our own anymore. We want to yield our lives to the Lord. We don't come to God and walk in truth and love to earn God's favor some people want to be good because they figure they have to earn God's favor. You can't earn God's favor. You can never be good enough to earn God's favor. Latent within you, this sin nature does the things that you're not supposed to do and doesn't do the things you know that you should. So there's no power in yourself to become the obedient child of God. The obedience comes as we bow the knee of our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and gives us life and our hardened hearts of stone are melted by His grace, making us new inside and changing our perspectives. This life-giving gift, and it is a gift from God, is not from us. It comes from the Lord. It comes from the Holy One. And it is a gift freely given to us. And it makes it possible for us to fulfill the calling to be holy, even as He is holy. His mercy sees us where we fall short and extends the scepter of acceptance to us, Jesus being the King, despite our imperfections. And I want you to know today, if you're broken, if you've misstepped, if you've sinned, if you've fallen away, if you've fallen off the wagon, if you've hurt yourself, you've hurt other people, there is mercy that is given by God's grace to you God's grace and mercy is not given to you to enable you to continue to be disobedient. His mercy and grace has been given to you to restore you. If you, if you sin, and all of us sin from time to time, He is just and able to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You are part of the family of God. He wants you to live for Him. And he, he extends his grace and his mercy. And this is why the apostles all prayed for mercy and peace. Why I close every service praying for us, for mercy, for grace, for peace to be bestowed upon us. Because we need it. Even though we're born again, we still have this rest. There's still a, a war out there. And we need his grace in abundance. We need his peace in abundance to tackle the things that are coming before us. And it's not, it can't be done with ourselves. We can't do it. You can't work yourself up to be good enough. You can't work yourself up to do all the right things all the right, with all the right timing. Only God can do that. He can do it. Trust Him. 
Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge the Lord in all of your ways and He will make your paths straight. He'll straighten your paths. He'll give you straight paths to walk. Is it going to be easy? No. The gate is narrow. The, day, the way can sometimes be very difficult, but God's grace will give you the strength to carry on and keep your eyes on Him. Hmm. Paul in Romans 6, 1 to 4. What shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. See, sin is no longer your master. As a believer in Jesus, your slavery is done. Jesus paid the price for that. He set you free from the bonds of sin and of death. You are child of God. You are not child of Satan any longer. You are child of God. Therefore, live like you are in reality. Thank the Lord for His love for you. Thank Him for His mercy and for His grace that you're not getting what you deserve. I don't deserve the grace and mercy of God. And neither do you, but He's given it nonetheless. Why? Because He is good. He is good. And let His grace and mercy compel you to love Him in truth. And that love for Him Will, and it will give you the power by the Holy Spirit to obey Him. God is interested in holiness. He's interested in obedience. But He's not interested in us trying to be holy like the Pharisees tried to be holy. That's not what He's interested in. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. The power to be holy is given through the person of the Holy Spirit. You are not your own. You are purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. Don't be deceived. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is power to be overcomers. You don't have to sin. You don't have to be overrun by the enemy. The enemy has been defeated. His head has been crushed under the foot of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't have to go the old ways anymore. You can live in the newness of the Spirit but you have to walk in step with Him. You have to yield to Him. You need to follow the truth and love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. How can I do that? I am a sinner. Yes, you, you are, but the Spirit will give you strength to be able to love the way God intended you to. This is why, this is, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand? There is no power within you and your flesh to overcome. You can't do it. You can try all you want. It is the Lord that gives you the strength to be an overcomer. God wants us to get this and get over the hang-ups of legalism which call us to do good in our own power and to avoid sin for the sake of earning acceptance by God. We do good and avoid sin because we're God's children and have the Holy Spirit within us not because we earn salvation through what we do. There's a difference, a huge difference. So, this is why the apostles and leaders would pray that God would grant people out of gratitude for that love and acceptance, we would grant them grace and peace. And out of, out of gratitude, those people would become slaves of righteousness. God wants you to be a slave of righteousness. Why? Because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's what the Lord says. If you follow the Lord, He's going to take care of you. He's going to give you everything you need for life and godliness in Him. Now, now John turns his focus to the last portion of his letter to the church, warning people to steer clear of false teachers. You see, there's a lot of false teaching that's going around, that's always gone around throughout the centuries, and that's still going around today that we need to be aware of. And, and in his letter to the church, he's saying, people, you got to be aware of this. I want you to get this. Did you see this? I want you to get the truth and love thing that we just talked about here and the, and the grace and the peace thing and the mercy thing. I want you to get this because guess what? Well, you're walking into a place where there's going to be a lot of deceivers. I say this, he says, verse 7, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person as the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, 
but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So John encourages the saints in this letter he's writing to ensure that they embrace the way of love and truth. And that is to live in obedience to the Word of God. And he's done this because there's this danger in the horizon from false teachers. And in the time of John the Apostle, I think I mentioned this before, there was this Gnosticism. And and the Gnostics were, they, they denied the Apostles' claim that Jesus Christ had literally come in the flesh. Because according to the false teacher's understanding, anything coming from the material realm of this world is evil. Therefore, Jesus could not have come into the earth as a literal human being because the world and everything in it is evil. All the material things in this world are evil. So therefore, they thought, they surmised that Jesus was a spirit being who only appeared like a mirage and, and, and gave the impression that he was a real human being, but he really wasn't. And the stories about the incarnation of Christ had to, had to be misinterpreted in the mind of the Gnostic because you couldn't take the Word of God literally that Jesus was literally a real flesh and blood human being, being like you and me. And John has lots to say about the Gnostics and about what they're saying here, right? That Jesus didn't actually come in the flesh. (laughs) Most of the early church fought against this heresy. It was a heresy of inner attitude. And I want to talk about this inner attitude because this inner attitude, it might not manifest itself in the same way as it did in the first century, but this inner attitude is prevalent in our society today. And if we're not careful, we will be led astray on the garden path away from the gospel, the true gospel of Christ, to a false gospel that is not from God. So the way that this heresy was introduced was through pride and deception and hatred. That was the root of this heresy. Pride, deception, and hatred. Now, talking about the Gnostic thought. Concerning the person of Jesus, Martin Luther once described the humanity of Jesus very well. He said, he ate, he drank, he slept, he waked, He was weary, he was sorrowful, he he was rejoicing, he wept, and he laughed. He knew hunger and thirst, and he knew toil, he knew sweat. He talked, he toiled, and he prayed. So there was no difference between Jesus Christ and other main men, save only this one thing, that he was God, and that he knew no sin. If God could enter into life only as some sort of disembodied phantom, then there is really no communion between God and humanity, and subsequently, there can be no exchange at the cross. There can be no real salvation through Jesus because, in fact, he would not be taking the place of man. Jesus had to be fully man, and he had to be fully God to be the Savior. Because he had to take the sin of the world on his shoulders and pay for the sin of the world. And to that, he had to be a real flesh and blood man like you and me. Jesus had to become what we are to make us what he is. Isn't that cool? He had to be. Friends, there's always a danger where we don't take the word of God literally. We take the Word of God with some thinking that we have to have some enlightened understanding that's beyond all the other people that are believers in Christ. It's a lofty understanding that we have that others don't have. We have this special knowledge. We have this special revelation from God that others don't have. And you just have to search for it. You have to seek for this knowledge that will be given to you. You see where that's rooted in? It's rooted in the same place that the Gnostic thought was rooted in. It's rooted in human pride. There is nothing you can do to gain acceptance from God in addition to what has been done by the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. The revelation that's given in His Word is given in plain terms so that everyone can understand the plan of salvation. 
so that everyone can see the Word of God and the Holy Spirit can bring it to their mind so that they're brought into new life. The Gnostic attitude still prevails. There's examples of this all over the place. Oh, the world could not have been created in six days. The world actually evolved because it's impossible for it to be created in six days. Hold on a second here. The Word of God tells us the world, word, the world was created in six days. I think we better take that seriously and pay attention to the face value of that and not try and come up with some lofty knowledge and some experimentation out there that the world plants in us that, that we think has to make sense because we can't get our head around the fact that God is big enough to speak things into existence. If God isn't big enough to speak to, into, to existence, the supernatural word of God is in question everywhere. Did Jesus really raise someone from the dead or was it just a mirage? Did, God have, did, did the people of Israel come to the Red Sea and there was this massive earthquake and it shifted the plates and the sea sloshed this way and that way and they walked across and then all of a sudden the earth shook again and it came back and it's just coincidental that they were there. Uh, was there a literal flood that swept the whole planet clean and killed every life form on the earth except for those that were in the ark? You see, when we open Pandora's box to this thought, this Gnostic thinking of higher learned thing that must be, we open Pandora's box to our own peril because the Word of God is truth. And when we step outside of the parameters of the Word of God, we're brought into a place where we are God. Where our pride elevates us to think that we have the keys, that we have the secrets. The Lord God has given us everything we need for life and godliness in Him. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Yes, there is faith. Does it take faith to believe God is big enough to create things in six days? Absolutely it does. It takes faith. But we don't know the eons that God was in existence planning all this when He spoke the Word. Eternity. God is eternal. We don't grasp that, do we? We think inside of our own heads in a box that we created. You know, this is God, and we have to put him in that box to get our head around. The, the Lord God is beyond us. He is higher than the heavens, like Francis Chan was saying. He's different than we are. Yes, he made himself human to become the sacrifice for us, but don't kid yourself. The God who created the heavens and the earth from the very beginning was God, and he knows all. He is all-powerful, and he can be anywhere he wants to be at any time he wants to be. He defies physics. He created physics and he created the world and placed it in the physical limitations that it's in right now. But don't, don't be fooled. He is beyond that. Is there a difference between him and us? Yes, there is. Is there a difference between Jesus Christ and when he was walking with us in his body and us as human beings today? No. He was a man just like you and me, yet he was the everlasting God. This is the miracle of the incarnation, my friends. There's always a danger that we'll lose track of reality and truth by letting our pride get into there saying that we need to know better. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God and he will lift you up in due time. John warns the lady and, and her children to avoid false teachers. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. Don't partner with people that teach heresy like the Gnostics. That's the word. Don't partner with them. There's nothing in common between us and the Gnostics. There's nothing in common between us who, and who teach a salvation by works through pride. There's nothing in common. This is a different gospel that they're teaching. Be careful. John's saying be careful. False teachings abound because the natural trend of pride leads us to have itching ears to hear something new. Something greater in revelation than what we've been shown. 
The Apostle Paul echoes John's thought when he warns Timothy of false teachers and their false teachings and charges Timothy to oppose them, actually, and to teach the people the truth. In 1 Timothy 1, 3-7, Paul says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Did you hear that? Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are so they are talking about or so what they so confidently affirm. It's the same thing today, people. Beware, be careful. Don't get led astray by things that divert you from the purpose of God. God's purpose is what? To seek and to save that which is lost and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a mission and the, the age is closing. The time is coming where Jesus is coming again. We have work to do. What? Not work of, of turmoil, but work of joy. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And you are the ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has sent you into the world. Yes, you and me. Together, not by ourselves. Together, arm in arm. Therefore, love one another. Love one another. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Love Christ and love each other. As John says in 2 John here, as you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. And I think we've defined it in the past. John finishes his letter to the people saying, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. And as your pastor, I could preach about this for another hour, but <laughs> I, I know that we all have things today to do. So John is like, I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy, so that our joy may be complete the children of your sister who is chosen by God, send their greetings. Now, I, again, I don't know if this was written to Mary in the church in Jerusalem or if this was some special lady in, in uh, the church in Asia Minor or whatever. I don't know, but I do know that this message applies to all of us here today. John wrote this under the inspiration of the Spirit so that we would walk in truth, we'd walk in love, and that we'd be obedient to Christ. We'd encourage each other to be obedient, to love each other, and to take the gospel out into the world, to watch out lest we be sidelined by false teaching. These are the things that John wanted to speak to us in this book. Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your peace. Lord, you know that we need all of these things in abundance. God, we're, we're just little children and you are everlasting to everlasting God and above all. So Lord, would you, have, would you have a look at our hearts, God, and take anything away, God, that isn't right? Help us, Lord, to focus on the things that you would have us to focus on and to learn the things that you would have us to learn and to be obedient in the areas that you would have us to be obedient. God, we pray that this coming fall will be a time where we launch and, and we obey you, Lord, and, and we fulfill your great commission where disciples are built strong in you, Lord, and that our hearts would burn with the, the, the passion that comes from your spirit, O oh God, that you'd compel us to be holy, Lord, that you'd compel us to to go to the people that we know and the neighborhoods that we live in and, and the streets in which we do our business, God, and that our hearts would be, would be open to sharing the good news that you have given to us to set us free. 
Jesus, we pray for a harvest of souls in this place. We pray that we would be mature in you, not lacking in anything. And God, that you protect us, Father, from the, the itching ear doctrines that are flying about everywhere out there in this world, that we would not look to the right or the left, we wouldn't get sidetracked from your mission, but we'd look at you, author and perfecter of our faith, and we'd realize that it's not about us and our club, it's about you and your club. And God, you want us to give of ourselves and to pour out to you and to pour out to others. So we pray that you give us that grace, peace, and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.